Uh, a word about the nature of proof. I want to emphasize that science cannot prove the existence of any entity in the way that people normally understand proof. I mean, for example, I can't provide you with absolute proof that my wife exists. I married my wife without that kind of proof available to me. And even after 30 years of performing experiments on her, I still lack absolute proof of her existence. But what science is able to do is to establish the existence of an entity to within a measurable probability. And that raises two questions concerning the identification of what's responsible for the record of nature. Is the evidence for the existence of a creator growing or shrinking as we scientists learn more and more about the record of nature? Uh, if the evidence is increasing, that's good for our model. If it's uh, shrinking, then that's bad uh, for our model. And then the other question is, is the evidence substantial enough that we can eliminate some of the alternate explanations uh, for the record of nature? Now, the creation model we're offering at Reasons to Believe is a biblical model. And none other than Sir Fred Hoyle, who is a lifelong opponent to the Christian faith, nevertheless said in his book, Nature of the Universe, there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible, and it is a remarkable conception. And indeed, Fred is right. The Bible is 10 times as much content on cosmology as any other holy book undergirding the religions of the world. And there's three main themes you're going to find in the Bible with respect to cosmology. The first is the best known, namely that there is this cosmic singularity beginning, a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. And in addition, there is the continual expansion of the universe from this point of beginning, and that this uh, universe gets colder and colder as it gets older and older. There's ongoing cooling. Now, most of you in the audience are probably somewhat familiar with the biblical statements supporting a cosmic singularity beginning. Probably the most famous sentence in the Bible is the opening one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Shemayen Ares, which is translated heavens and earth, uh, means the entire physical universe encompassing all matter, energy, space, and time. The Hebrew verb to create, bara, means to create something brand new that never existed before. And these other verses in the Bible amplify that. Hebrews 11.3, for example, states, the universe was formed at God's command. It was not made out of what was visible. And other Bible verses not included here explicitly declare that space and time were created when the universe began. Now, these statements date back in the Bible two, three, sometimes 3,500 years ago. And it wasn't until 1970 that science had advanced to the point where we could actually explore this question of the beginning of the universe. And it started with this paper published by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose back in 1970, The Singularities of Gravitational Collapse in Cosmology. Indeed, it was this paper that catapulted Stephen Hawking to worldwide fame. Now, if you love tensor calculus, you won't be able to put this paper down. But it does end with a sentence or a paragraph that everyone can understand. The conclusion of this mathematical theorem is that if the universe contains mass, and if general relativity reliably describes the dynamics of the universe, then space and time must be created. Space and time must have a beginning, and it must be created by a causal agent that transcends space and time. As such, I've written in my books that this makes these space-time theorems the most theologically significant theorem that human beings have ever produced. How so? The gods of the non-biblical religions, are, they claim to create within space and time that always exists. What's unique about the Bible is that the God of the Bible declares that he creates independent of space and time rather than within space and time. So whether or not this theorem is true has tremendous philosophical and theological significance. Now, when this theorem was published, we could only prove that general relativity reliably describes cosmic dynamics to about 1% precision. But what has happened since 1970 is that the number of tests of the theory of general relativity have grown to such a degree that uh, general relativity now ranks as the most exhaustively tested principle in all of physics 
and the best proven principle in all of physics. And the most dramatic proof has come through the study of binary neutron stars, which proves that general relativity reliably describes the dynamics of the universe, not just to 1% precision, but to better than a trillionth of a percent precision. And now we've got the gravity B probe that's orbiting the Earth, which will provide us with yet another test. Within a year, we'll see whether general relativity passes that test. And then the theorems are becoming more generally applicable. What I have here are five papers published over the course of five years or ten years uh, by Borde and Valinken. And what they did is they took the space-time theorem of Penrose and Hawking and said, how much can we extend the validity of this theorem? Because after all, Hawking and Penrose only developed the theorem in the context of classical general relativity. And so Borde and Valinkin in these uh, five papers demonstrated that it also applies to all manner of inflationary hot Big Bang models. And their latest uh, papers show that it also applies to quantum gravity creation models. And in their last paper, they were able to conclude that all reasonable cosmic models are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems. And what they mean by reasonable, they did show some ways that you can avoid the implications of the space-time theorems, but those would be model universes where physical life could never exist. So any universe that allows for the existence of physical life indeed is subject to this beginning of space and time and a causal agent beyond space and time that's responsible for bringing it into existence. Now we're talking about it reasons to believe as a testable creation model and so just looking at this concept does the universe have a beginner that transcends space and time we're sticking our neck, necks out with six additional predictions of what scientists will discover as they continue to do this kind of research. That the evidence for a single cosmic beginning as opposed to multiple beginnings uh, will grow. That the evidence for finite time rather than infinite time will increase. And three, that the evidence that general relativity reliably describes cosmic dynamics will get stronger as it is than it is right now. And that four, the grip of the space-time theorems will become even more relentless than they are today. And the case for a transcendent causal agent will gain strength as we learn more and more about the origin of the universe. And most significantly, we would predict that evidence for other miraculous acts will be found. Now, I want to emphasize this point, because what we've demonstrated here with the rigor of these mathematical theorems and the experimental proofs of the reliability of general relativity is that we are confronted with an undeniable miraculous act. That there's this agent that is bringing into existence matter, energy, space, and time independent of matter, energy, space, and time. Which means we can no longer define science as an enterprise that keeps the miraculous out. The miraculous, unavoidably, is already in the scientific uh, enterprise. And therefore, we have to be open to the possibility that this uh, causal agent may have chosen to intervene more than just on one occasion. Now, as much as the Bible says about the beginning of the universe, it says much more about the expansion of the universe. Now, notice that none of this is in the book of Genesis. A mistake that people often make is thinking all the creation content in the Bible is in the book of Genesis when in fact Genesis has only got four creation accounts, there are 21 others beyond the book of Genesis. And as these creation accounts that explain in detail this continual expansion of the universe, based on the Hebrew verb nata, usually translated in the English Bibles as a stretching out of the heavens, but the verb nata actually is better translated the continual expansion thereof. And these are just a few of the passages that describe this, and some of them go into the details of describing it as a surface effect, that the universe is a surface phenomena where all of the physics is on the surface, and the, the surface is continuously expanding. Now, most people today don't doubt the idea that we live in a continuously expanding universe. Uh, but for the benefit of lay people, we now have these Hubble Space Telescope photographs, uh, photo images, that show us what the universe looked at different epochs. Now, the one you see on the left is what the universe looks like 12 billion light years away and therefore 12 billion years ago, compared with this one where we see the universe 
two billion light years away and therefore two billion years ago. And you can see how the stretching out of the heavens, the continual expansion of the universe, has pushed the galaxies farther and farther away from one another. And this is all the scale. You can actually see that galaxies today are bigger than galaxies in the past. Over on the left, the galaxies are so close together, they're ripping spiral arms uh, off one another. And therefore, there's no basis for doubting any longer. We live in this continuously expanding universe. But keep in mind that for thousands of years, the Bible was the only text making this claim that we lived in a continuously expanding universe. Scientists didn't discover this until 1917. Now, additionally, the Bible frequently comments on the fixity of the laws that govern the universe. Jeremiah 33:25. I have established the fixed laws of heaven and earth. This is one of seven passages in the Bible proclaiming the constancy of the laws of physics. And we can now prove this experimentally by making measurements on quasars 10, 11, 12, even 13 billion light years away. And we look at these distant quasars, we see that the laws of physics 13 billion years ago are the same as the laws of physics we observe today. But the significant point here is if the universe is expanding, continuously expanding under constant laws of physics, then the laws of thermodynamics, which we see explicated in the book of Romans, chapter 8, the law of decay that pervades the universe, would imply that the universe would get colder and colder with respect to time, and would get colder and colder according to a very particular exponential curve. That black line there is the cooling of the universe you would expect of what the Bible statements say are correct. And then you can see we have nine measurements of the temperature of the universe at these different epochs, confirming that indeed the universe is cooling down in the manner that the Bible uh, predicts. 